Jonah, and it's titled Down But Not Under. So if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah is part of the uh, collection of books called the Minor Prophets. In case you are uh, recent to church and to the whole way the Bible has been put together, it's called the Minor Prophets simply because it's uh, small in, in, in size. The bigger books are called Major Prophets. For example, Isaiah, Ezekiel, these are all the Major Prophets. Books like Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, these are called Minor Prophets simply because of the size of the book. Okay, and I know Jonah is a very tiny, tiny uh, uh, book. It's uh, just four chapters. If you don't know where the book is, the easier thing is to do to go to the contents and just look at the thing and go go ahead and uh, look at the book, right? Because I do that all the time. So that's okay. Just Jonah is after Obadiah. Even before we look at uh, God's word, let's uh, look to God in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I bring every thought captive under the power and blood of Jesus. Speak to us, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Jonah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. But even before we uh, jump into the book, uh, I want to I mention that sometimes we go through uh, accounts like this in Scripture, and we feel like we've heard this in Sunday school. Uh, we've kind of grown up uh, listening to stories like this. Maybe you're recent uh, here to church, and uh, you're just beginning to read the Bible, and you feel like uh, sometimes you come to stories like this. It, you don't say it out, but it comes to your mind. You feel like, did this really happen, right? It's going to talk about a story where uh, uh, a fish swallows a guy, right? A guy stays in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and you feel like, does this really happen? Is this true? Now, when you read accounts like this, a simple uh, way to understand this, we are not going to prove this, we are not going to try and understand how this happened, how big the fish was and all that, but simple way to understand. Let me, let me point out a scripture. It's uh, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Let's just quickly read that verse. Here Jesus is actually talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. Matthew 12, 39. He says, uh, but he answered and said to them, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now here is Jesus uh, recalling the account of Jonah. He says, for just as Jonah was in the... Uh, was there three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, which is the fish, uh, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now here is Jesus comparing his resurrection, his uh, bodily death and resurrection, to an event that happened in the Old Testament, which is uh, actually Jonah. So if Jesus uh, seems to have thought Jonah really happened, if Jesus thought Jonah happened, I'm going to go with Jesus, right? I would probably believe that Jesus uh, thought it happened. I'm going to believe that it happened. So that's a simple way to know if these things are true. Now, you guys are looking at me as though, what is he saying, right? It's, it's a funny way to understand scripture, okay? All right, let's move on. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, Jonah is a, uh, is a prophet from the Old Testament. He's during the time of Jeroboam, okay, or Rehoboam. You find it in uh, 2 Kings 14, if you look at that, he is actually a prophet in Israel. So here is uh, Jonah, and the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now here is the city, Nineveh, if you want a, 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 a current account. Nineveh is some, somewhere uh, in the region of Iraq. It's in the Middle East. It's a great city, that's what it says. Now, the wickedness of these people has reached to an extent where God has to step into history and judge. God has to do something about it, right? But even before that, even before the judgment falls on this uh, nation or this uh, city, God sends his prophet with the message of judgment. Now, every message of judgment is a message of grace because even before the judgment comes, God pleads with the people to repent. So it's a message of grace. So God decides to send his prophet Jonah to this city. Let's see what happens. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. Verse 3, But, but, Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. Right? The, 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 the writer is putting it in a beautiful way. He, he, he uses the same verbs to describe what is happening. Initially, he tells, God tells Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh. Right? And the, the writer is using the same verb. Jonah arose. In Hebrew, it's the same. Jonah arose, but he didn't go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. 
So what he does is he goes down to Joppa. He finds a ship which is going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down uh, in, into then to go into uh, Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And I want you to think about this. And I have a small map just to give you an uh, illustration of where all these cities are, right? If you look at it right there, uh, that's where Joppa is. Joppa is a port, right? He has to come and he has to go to the port. He's going down. Maybe he's in a hilly uh, country somewhere. He's going down to Joppa. He's going to catch a ship. God is asking him to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is 500 miles inland. You got to go take a caravan. You got to take a camel. You got to walk. You do something like that. You go inland for 500 miles. There is Nineveh. But here is Jonah. He is fleeing to Tarshish, which is where? Where is that? Can you see that? Spain, right? It is 2,500 miles exactly in the opposite direction of Nineveh. Jonah decides to flee from the presence of the Lord. Jonah decides to run. But now you will see in this account that you can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. You can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. It is because of his incredible grace and mercy that he begins to pursue us. Jonah decides to run away exactly in the opposite direction. And maybe you're sitting here this morning. Maybe that is your life story. Maybe you are at a place in your life where you seem to be making decisions that are exactly opposite to what God is asking you to do. Now there are different reasons why people run away from God. Uh, there could be a, a general reason, right? Generally, in a general sense, their life orientation is away from God. Maybe there is something that happened in their life. Maybe they had to go through some pain, maybe some tragedy, maybe the death of a loved one, uh, or maybe some kind of sickness, or maybe a rejection, maybe something uh, bad, maybe there's some disappointment happened in their life, and they feel like God allowed this in my life, and God is the reason for why this is happening in my life. And maybe in a general sense, People run away from God, their life orientation. They don't want to do anything with God. They move away from God. You know, there are also people who run away from God in a very specific sense, not in a general sense. Maybe you come to church, maybe you're involved, maybe you do different things, uh, maybe you worship, you read the Bible, but in a very specific sense, maybe there are specific areas in your life where you run away from God. Maybe there are areas which are forbidden, areas that, that are out of bounds for people. Maybe your family does not know. Maybe it's a secret. Uh, your spouse does not know. Your friends do not know. Not even God can handle that. This is out of bounds for people. This is my area. Yes, all this area is accessible to people and to God, but not this area of my life. This is my precious Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a financial decision. And sometimes we have these areas in life where we are running away from God in a very specific sense. And I don't know what your background is this morning. Maybe you are running away from God in a very general sense or you are running away from God in a very specific area of your life. Here is Jonah. He decides to run from God. Verse 4. Let's move on with the story. Verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break. Now God steps in, right? And God sends this uh, great wind and it's almost like an exaggeration, but it's like it, it feels like the ship was about to break and that, such was the storm that hit this ship. Uh, verse 5, then the sailors uh, became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was on the ship in order to lighten it uh, for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen sound asleep. Now think about this. The ship is about to break. People are crying. They don't know if they're going to make it uh, for the next hour. They're going to die. And in this chaotic, fearful, frightening situation, here is Jonah going down to the, uh, the, to the deck, the, the lower part of the ship, and he is sound asleep. There's nothing that wakes him up. Have you seen people who can sleep through anything? You, you've seen people like that? Some of you just woke up, but yeah. <laughs> I've had a, I had an uncle and aunt in, in back in Chennai, and they are seasoned, right? Seasoned uh, uh, believers, Christians. But what they do is they go to this traditional church, and they open the Bible in front of them. They have the hymnal book, and both of them sit straight. They'll sit straight, put their head down, 
and they will sleep through the service. I mean, they'll be sleeping. Nothing will rock them, right? They will be straight. If you and I try that, we'll, we'll be afraid if we'll fall down, but they are just so seasoned. Some people can sleep. So here is Jonah. He is sleeping through that. Think about it, right? Verse 6. Verse 6. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. So here is the captain wakes him up and he's wondering why this guy is sleeping. How can he sleep? He wakes him up. He says, You cry out to your God. So here is Jonah who runs away from God. Now, when you look at people who run away from God, you find a very similar characteristic in their life. Now, it is not that these people want to do that. It is because of the nature and reality of the person who runs away from God. You think about it. The first thing you will notice that when people run from God, they run with people who are also running from God. Here is Jonah. He is on a ship to some nation with people who do not know God and he's on the ship, he's running away from God. And in reality, even in my life and in your life, when I decide to run away from God, I run with people who are also running from God. That is my circle. Those are my friends. Those are my influencers. Let me illustrate that. When I was growing up, my, my, my friend, uh, he was in his eighth standard and uh, he, uh, he, he failed the annual exam, right? He couldn't make it to the next level. Uh, so he was very disappointed. Uh, he didn't know what to do. Uh, there were like uh, 10 to 15 students in his class who, who failed that time. So what they did is, as an 8th standard student, 8th uh, grade student, what he did is he decided to run away from home. Uh, he went to the station. He took a train. They wanted to go uh, somewhere. I don't know where they wanted to go, but they decided to run away. But you think about it. My friend did not run with all the toppers in class. Are you with me? He didn't call the f topper, the first rank holder, second rank holder, come on, let's run away from home. They didn't do that. He didn't run away with guys who are the best students of the year award. He didn't run with those guys. He didn't run with guys with merit and award. He ran away with guys who also failed and who were running away from home. It is not that they want to do that. It is the nature and reality of the person who decides to run away from God. Secondly, when you run from God, you begin to do some strange, dangerous, and even some sometimes stupid things. You make decisions that uh, seem so nice, but it looks so obviously wrong. Decisions and choices that are so bad, that are so bizarre, and sometimes people do this over and over again. Why? Because it is the nature of the person who decides to run away from God. When I was in college, I had this bunch of friends. Now, if you're in college, this is a good advice. Never sit in the last row, okay? You don't sit in the last row because every time the teacher wants to catch somebody, they're going to pick on the guy on the last row. So what I do is I sit on the row that is before the last row, okay? You, don't, you are still bad, but you are not that bad, okay? So you're there in the last. So one of the, one of the, or during one of the classes, my friends, these, these guys were just bizarre. I mean, so what they did is they, uh, they bought this uh, alcohol, right? Now, this cheap alcohol. Now, in Chennai, what happens is every engineering college, uh, there is a there is a alcohol shop. What do you call that? I mean, that, that shop is there everywhere, right? I mean, I don't know what the strategy is. But these guys will go. They bought this. They wanted to party in the night. So they got all this stuff. And it's cheap, right? It's, it's in a plastic, like a, a water packet, right? It's in a packet. It's very cheap. They bought that. They placed it in a bag, they, in, a, in a bag, all these packets of cheap alcohol. Put it in the last row. Now, during the lunch break, what happened is a couple of guys got into a fight, and somehow they pushed the guy on the bag, and the, and the packets burst. Okay, think about this. I want you to imagine this. I know it's hard. Think about it. The packets burst, and the whole class was reeking with alcohol, right? And we are in mechanical. There's no girls in class, only guys, and we can handle the, the bad smell and all that. But, but the professor is going to come. The next three hours is my HOD. So what these guys thought is they knew if he found out, these guys are gone. They are toast, right? So they went. They bought these brushes. They bought all this phenyl and all kinds of stuff. They were cleaning the entire class during the lunch break. And you think about it. Why would anybody do something like that? What a crazy situation. But that is the nature of somebody who decides to run away from God. Now, In my class, I had a couple of guys... They decided to pair a uh, steal a pair of jeans. 
Have you ever tried that? Don't, don't do that. <laughs> so they went to Globus. There's a store called Globus in a, in a mall. They, uh, these guys are good. They, they have everything. It's not that they, wanna, they don't have pair of jeans or anything. They wanted to go steal for the thrill of it. So what they did is, you know, mechanical students, you'd, you'd think they'd know better, but they removed their jeans, they put the new pair of jeans, and then they wore their jeans on top, and they decided to run from the store. Okay, this is the strategy. <laughs> I don't know. They didn't realize that there's a thing, there's, a, there's something on the thing, right? There's like a thing that's attached to the gene which will be, beep if you don't pay for it, you don't remove that, it's gonna beep. So these two guys, they made the run. They run out of the door and here is this alarm system that goes off and the entire mall crew, the, all the mall cops are running after them. They close the mall, these guys are catching them. The next day, cops come to the college, they make all of us stand and it's like a embarrassing, bad situation and you feel like I look back and I feel like man what a crazy life what kind of decision making is this but that is the nature of somebody who decides to run away from God and sometimes we see that uh, <laughs> we see that in the lives of others we see that in our own friends we see that in our own family members and sometimes we are in the midst of such decisions You run from God, you run with those who run away from God. When you run from God, you begin to make some dangerous and stupid and even strange decisions. Thirdly, you, you begin to hurt people who are in close proximity. When you run from God, you begin to hurt people in close proximity. You think about this. Here is this guy in the ship. Uh, but he has put his entire crew in danger. The entire ship, the entire crew, everybody is going to die. Everybody who is close to him are now in a point of danger. You hurt people because of the choices, because of the decisions to run away from God. Now, I've worked with young people for a long time, and there are times when uh, parents would call me. Right? They would call me in the middle of the night, There'll be a mom on the other end of the phone and she'll be crying. She'll be sobbing because her son has not come home and she does not know where her son is. They don't know where he's gone. He's just gone all night and they are crying. They are frantic. They don't know what has happened to him. We end up hurting people who are close to us. Recently, I met with a guy who had come back from England. Now, this guy had followed a girl. He was in a relationship for eight years. He followed this girl to England. A lot of people advised him not to do that, but he still pursued. He went. He, he was there with her, uh, but things didn't work out. She moved on. This guy could not move on. He returned back to India, but he was broken. He was broken. He did not want to go home. His, his parents were praying. His parents were asking him to come back, but he did not want to face them, so he stayed in Delhi. He became an alcoholic. He, he was into too many things. And sometimes you make choices in life and when your life's orientation is to run away from God, when there are areas in your life where you are running away from God, you begin to hurt people. And we are familiar with that. We know what that is. Lastly, when you, when you run away from God, you go deep, you go numb. You go deep and you go numb. Think about this. Here is Jonah, and the, and the, and the writer is putting it in a beautiful literary way. Uh, he's pointing this out in verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went where? He went down, right? He went down. What about the next? Uh, he said, uh, when a Joppa found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down. Okay? Verse uh, 5. It is almost like a progression. The sailors became afraid. Blah, blah, and then he goes through the cargo into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below, which is again the verb, same Hebrew word, down into the hold of the ship. He lay down and fallen asleep. And eventually you read the story, he goes down into the depths of the sea, into the belly of the sea monster. And the, and the writer is giving you an indication. He's saying every choice, every decision he's making, he is going down and down and down and down. It is almost like a spiral downwards. And every time he goes down, he becomes numb to what is happening around him. He becomes callous. He does not feel. And so here he is. He is lying down in the hold of the ship and he is sleeping without any care or concern. And sometimes that is the nature and the reality of a person who decides to run away from God. 
And when I was growing up, I had this alarm clock to wake me up, right? And some of the young people, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But this is the alarm clock where you give the key at the back, right? Good. Some people are nodding, right? I mean, you give the key at the back, and once the alarm goes, you hit it on the head so that it stops, okay? You, you, you know what I'm talking about, the alarm clock, right? So you give the key. So wh during uh, my school days, I used to go to the athletic practice. So I used to wake up in the morning. So I'm very excited about doing all this stuff. So I keep the alarm, right? I keep the alarm at 5 in the morning. And uh, the first day of practice, you're not even able to sleep through the night because you are so excited. You are not able to sleep. You wake up. It's just 1 o'clock. I mean, I'm like, okay, 1 o'clock. I got to go back to sleep. And then you wake up. It's only 3 o'clock. And you are not able to sleep. And even before the alarm goes off, you wake up. You're getting ready. And you, you are off to what you need to do. A week later, right, a week later, the alarm goes. You're sleeping. You're not excited anymore. You're sleeping. It's now tired now. And, and the alarm goes. Tring, it goes. And then you wake up. And you, you're sensitive. You wake up. You hit it on the head. And then you do your thing. You get ready and go wherever you need to go. A month later, right, it is not just one cycle. It's maybe two, three rounds of ringing. And then you wake up. You hit it on the head. And then you go. Six months later. Six months later, and I'm sleeping, I wake up, it's 9 o'clock, right? I've missed the entire show, right? I'm gone. And I wake up, and I'm furious. I go to my mom. I'm like, Mom, why didn't you wake, up? wake me up? What, what about the alarm? She said, the alarm went the entire time. You slept through the alarm. You become numb. And sometimes that happens in our own lives. Remember the first time you decided to cheat in an exam? <laughs> I know you guys did that. <laughs> You're shaking, the paper is shaking and blurry, you're sweating and all this stuff. Remember the first time you decided to lie to your parents? You're not able to look at them. You're not able to make eye contact. You're looking down. Remember the first time you decided to do something that was forbidden, something that your parents did not want to do or something that you knew it was not good and you had butterflies in your stomach and you did not. But then slowly... Slowly, as you keep doing it, you go deeper and deeper and you become numb to the prompting of the Spirit of God, to the prompting of your conscience. And then the alarm goes. The first time the alarm is real, but slowly the alarm goes and you don't even feel it anymore. You've become a professional. You go deep, you go numb. The person does not want to do that. It is not like they enjoy doing this, but it is the nature and reality of the person who decides to run away from God. You can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. You can run from God, but you cannot, cannot outrun God because God gets involved. God gets involved. And you will see from verse 7, you will see that God gets involved not to pay you back, but to bring you back. God gets involved not to shame you, not to condemn you, not to make you feel small, not to ridicule you. That is all what man does, but not God. God gets involved not to pay you back, but to bring you back. Verse 7. Look at verse 7. God begins to get involved. And you will see that in different points in time, it is God who is orchestrating the whole situation. Verse 7. Each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Now this is not a recommendation that we do this, but this is the practice of, of that culture. So they cast lots and here is even the lot was picked and it was Jonah. And they said to him, uh, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where are you from? Which country are you from? What, what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And now these guys freak out. They're like, what kind of a God do you worship? Verse 10, then the men became extremely afraid and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do so that the sea may become, become calm for us? So here the sailors are asking this guy, what, what, what can we do so that the sea does not uh, drown us and it doesn't kill us? What do we do? 
here is Jonah. This is an opportunity for him to come clean. This is an opportunity for him to tell them, hey, boss, you know what? This is because of me. You know what? I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to stop running. I'm going to orient my life towards God and towards what he wants me to do. But that's not what happens. Look at it. Verse 12, Jonah said to them, what? Pick me up, throw me into the sea. He is in a place where he does not want to come back. He says, you know what? I'm going to die. I don't want to turn back. I want to die. And you will realize if you go on with the story later in the coming few weeks, you will see that he will, he will blame God for, for being in the sea. Who, whose idea was it to be thrown into the sea? Whose idea? It was his idea. He said, you throw me into the sea and the sea will become calm. It wasn't God's idea. It was his idea. But then later he will blame God for what has happened. Right? And you think about it. Sometimes it's true in our own lives. Sometimes we make the choices. We make the decisions. Sometimes we go where we are not supposed to go. We do things we are not supposed to do. And we continue and we pursue and it is, uh, we look for satisfaction. We do all this stuff and finally, eventually, when we have to face the consequence of our own actions, we blame God. We're like, God, you, you brought this person into my life. God, you could have stopped me. What were you doing? You did this. You allowed this. You made me do it. And somehow we turn the tables and we blame God. And here he is. He will eventually blame God. But he says, you know what? Throw me into the sea. But God shows up. God gets involved. Now the people are trying to help him, right? Verse 13, how are the men rowed desperately to return to land? But they could not, for the sea was becoming uh, even stormier against them. Uh, then they call on the Lord, they earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. Uh, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. The men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And God, out of his immense grace, out of his immense mercy, sends a fish to swallow Jonah. God gets involved not to pay you back, to bring you back. And God is not like man. And sometimes I look at my own life and I, I, I'm in these counseling situations, right? You talk to people, uh, you give them some advice, they, they listen to you, they nod, but then they go back and do the same thing, right? I mean, it's, it's bad. They, they talk about it, we discuss stuff, and they go back and do the same thing. And after a year, I meet them, and it's almost in the tip of my tongue. I want to tell them, boss, I told you. Didn't I tell you one year back? Right? That is what man does. He wants to remind you. He wants to do all these things to you, but not God. Not God. God gets involved, not to pay me back, but to bring me back. And when I was growing up, my parents, uh, though they were brought up in a very uh, conservative Christian environment, they kind of moved away. And when I was 10 years old, my uh, my dad had an intense pain in, in his stomach, in his abdomen area. So they took him to the Apollo hospital. They did some tests. And they found that uh, his uh, one kidney was dead from birth. I don't know how that happens, but one kidney was dead from birth. The other kidney had a lot of stones in it. And during that time, it was a while back, uh, they could not do anything. So they said, we're going to give you a few months to live. Uh, and uh, we can't, uh, w w we don't know what's going to happen and you're probably going to die. And they asked my mother to sign a blank sheet of paper and they said, we're going to do some tests, we're going to do some uh, procedures and if it works out, it's fine. If not, uh, we can't assure anything to you. So uh, my mom and dad, they decided not to go ahead with that option. So they uh, checked, them, checked, them, checked themselves out of the hospital. They went home, but that is the time they decided to pray. They decided to come back to God. They, they sought the Lord. They would pray. And I would remember that people would come home and they were praying for our family, for my dad. And as I look back, and I see that it seemed like a very dark time. It seemed like we we're going to lose uh, our father. We we're going we're to lose my dad. It seemed like things were going to fall apart. Our future was bleak and dark. And we feel like, why is God allowing this? But I look back and I see all that happened because God did not pay us back. He wanted to bring us back. And in a glorious way, my parents came back to the Lord and my dad was completely healed. And things just took a turn for the better. And I look back and I see, you know what? 
it was God. God stepped in to bring us back. And sometimes we look at our own lives and we, we know what God is doing. We know we are here not by accident, but because of a divine plan and design. We know the people God is bringing into our lives is not by accident, but it is because of his plan. And there is something happening. We know that there are circumstances that are happening in our lives that is, that, that is maybe crushing us, maybe pressurizing us, and maybe putting us in a corner not to shame us. But we know it is God who is trying to get our attention. The question is, will you stop running? Will you stop running? Today you can do that. You can tell God, God, I'm tired of running. Maybe I'm tired of running in, my, in a general sense. Maybe it's this one area. Maybe it's this one secret part of my life. And I'm tired of running away from you. Today, you can quit running. Today, you can stop running. That's what happened in scripture, right? God got involved by sending his own son, Jesus, into this world. Not so that he will condemn us but so that he will bring us back. He died on the cross. He rose again on the third day so that you and I can have a relationship with him. Maybe you've been coming and hearing uh, these talks. Maybe you've been coming to church and you've been hearing about Jesus and you've been postponing decisions. Maybe you've not really surrendered your life to him. Will you stop running? Today, you could do that. Let's pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This is an important time between you and God. And now the Spirit of God has spoken to you through His Word. Would you look at your own life and would you allow the Spirit of God to move in your heart? Maybe there are areas God is pointing in your life. Maybe there are some decisions. Maybe there are some people. Maybe there are some choices. Maybe there are some habits. Maybe God is bringing it out and he's saying, hey, would you quit running? Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I pray that in response to your word that my life's decision would be to stop running. I thank you because you get involved to bring me back. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I pray for my friends. If there is anyone who is going through a life similar to this, I pray that even this morning that they will turn, they will stop, and they will turn to you. I thank you because you are always there for us. You never let go. Oh no, you never let go. And I thank you for that. And I know that there are some people who are praying for, for their own family. Maybe for their own children. Maybe for their spouse. Oh God, I pray that you will hear their prayers. And I pray that my friends will stop running. Thank you for this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forever.